First of all, uh, introductions. Um, Hans is not here, but uh, I gave a version of this talk with Hans at um, FASTEM earlier on this year. So um, all of these slides come from FASTEM. <laughs> I updated the logo, though, just for you guys. So um, uh, the narrow and uh, red hat uh, and lib camera. Um, lib camera is, is both a project and a, an organization. It's, it's a company. Um, have been uh, collaborating together to solve a particular problem with uh, uh, MIPI cameras specifically um, over the last while. So this is me, I'm Brian. I work on the uh, Lenaro Qualcomm uh, landing team. Um, I recently inherited, not, not so about a year ago I suppose, the uh, camera subsystem um, uh, in the upstream for, for, for Linux. Um, yeah, you can find me on IRC sometimes. There's my uh, code Lenaro, the place I dump all of my in-progress kernel work. There's my GitHub, and don't look up my handle on Twitter unless you want to discuss politics. Uh, which has nothing to do with this presentation, by the way. So, what is this talk about? A, Bayer encoding. What is Bayer encoding, and uh, why do we care? Um, what is a hard ISP? What are the three A's? What is an ISP? Uh, soft ISP and lib camera. Why is that a thing? Um, why do we care again? Lib camera and pipewire uh, integration. Uh, the future plans for what we want to do with soft ISP and lib camera, and a demo. Always very risky. Always very risky doing a demo. Okay. So what is Bayer encoding, and why do we care? I, when I, I freely admit, when I inherited the uh, CAMSS stuff. I didn't know the answer to that. I'd heard of Bayer, but I didn't really know. Um, and uh, the question is, what is it and why do we even use it? And so like, I, I, I found some interesting terms when I was uh, researching why Bayer encoding was created to begin with. And uh, the main reason why is that your eye is sensitive to this bit of the spectrum right here. This kind of greeny yellow, Jesus, that's right in my eye. This greeny yellow, I'm quite sensitive to white light as the projector myself. Uh, this greeny kind of yellow bit of the spectrum here. So your eye has um, rods and cones, as we all know. So when you go from light into dark or dark into light, it literally takes a while for you physiologically to, to switch from one mode to the other. Um, rods are uh, scotopic and cones are photopic. Um, I suppose it's not, not very interesting to go into the terms of it, but, but then the question is, how do we encode that? So our, our, our sensors are actually, if you think about it, they're just um, ADCs in a sense that react to light. And they have no real concept of spectrum and they don't care how we see the spectrum. So what we do is we put a filter over each one of the individual sensors that's sensitive to a particular uh, component of the uh, frequency spectrum. Uh, and since we've established that you're more sensitive to green than to blue or to red, it kind of makes sense that we want to encode more spectral information in, in the green bit of the, in the, green bit of the uh, photons hitting the, the sensor. And so this guy called Bruce Bayer in 1974 came up with the, the scheme to encode the maximum amount of retrievable information. Because we need to get red, green, and blue. We want to retrieve more green than anything else. And so the Bayer encoding pattern is literally something along the lines of green, blue, green, blue, green, blue, green, blue, red, green, red, green, red, green. Um, there's his paper. I thought this was kind of very analog. He just rolls it down on a little bit of paper back in 1974. So there are a number of ways of, once we've encoded, uh, Bayer encoded information to retrieve it, right? So we now have, uh, you know, a, a lossy encoding format, and we need to retrieve the maximum amount of data from that format that we can when we are reconstructing, because what we want is red, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, green, blue. But what we get is green or blue or green or blue 
or red, which is gonna be one line lower. So it's kind of an, an interesting approach, and, and there are a number of different ways of retrieving that information or inferring the information based on the, the component of the adjacent uh, encoded pixels. So if you imagine that at the red here, you're still going to have information that pertains to the green beside it and vice versa. And so therefore, there are a number of algorithms to infer, make, make a fairly good guess as to what the green or the blue was for any, for any red and so on. So there's label, nearest, bilinear, and uh, Malar, Hay, Cutler. I'm, I'm terrible at pronouncing uh, non-Irish names, never mind, <laughs> non-English names. Uh, but um, typically, this one here is extreme. I mean, and you know, as the, as the quality of the retrieval goes up, the computational time and effort also goes up. I mean, it, it, it's the same principle from any scheme and, and anywhere in computer science. Um, typically, you will find that nearest or bilinear uh, retrieval is used because they're pretty close, they get you pretty good results, and they aren't as computationally costly as the, as the last one here. So here is what it actually looks like when you take. So th this is from uh, a really good paper by a guy called um, Morgan McGuire. Um, I have an, an apostrophe here. I don't think that's correct. I think it's, it's Morgan McGuire, not McGuire and Morgan. Um, when you look at a Bayer encoded uh, image, it looks a little bit like this. So there's a, a, a mosaic pattern. It looks like uh, a mosaic pattern, something you'd find uh, in the Roman Forum. Um, we call this ground truth, raw image, label, you see? You don't want to be getting label out of your, uh, your camera when you take a picture. Nearest, uh, you, you may or may not be able to see, it's quite edgy. Bilinear is pretty good. And as I say, the, the other one here, which is much more computationally costly, is, is far better. Um, with the high resolution sensors we have now, the last debayering method kind of doesn't make sense because we have loads of, we have loads of uh, information to work with already. And um, so typically, again, it's nearest or bilinear. Okay, so what is a hard ISP? So if you think about it, every time you, were, you take a picture with your phone, a whole bunch of stuff is happening. It's not just debayering the image. It's doing a, a lot more than that. It's uh, correcting for exposure. It's uh, maybe doing autofocus, auto white balance, um, correct, uh, correcting lens flare. Um, and usually that is done in, in a hard ISP. So for your phone, that's, that's always done in a thing called a hard ISP. So basically this, this works on the principle, again, of locality. You've, um, you've received a frame into your DRAM or maybe SRAM somewhere, and you need to process it before you hand it off to user space for stuff. Um, and uh, that, that process is typically called a hard ISP. So that would be a concatenation of hardware silicon blocks and firmware. Uh, that process that incoming data, the, the first part of that is just to debayer it. Um, so interestingly, well, for me, if, if this here is ground truth, i.e. the image that you want to take, the one on the left is underexposed and the one on the right is overexposed. Now, when I did this at FOSTEM, the one on the extreme right um, looked better to me. And I thought, can't you know the... The one in the middle doesn't really look like what I would call ground truth. Um, but uh, it's interesting on this projector, it's different. Um, camera companies, including Apple, Google, Qualcomm, who I work with extensively, um, any, any Panasonic, Sony, whoever, they consider the, the method for debayering 
Well, not really. I mean, everybody knows it's it, the bayering we've been doing since 1974. It's not secret sauce by any means. But hard ISPs are treated as a kind of holy grail that thou shalt not touch or interfere with and must be locked down with every legal mechanism available. Um, and the, the truth is that for some of the more advanced algorithms, this is, this is certainly true, but for the, for the boilerplate stuff, it's really not. So the, the three A's, autofocus, auto white balance, uh, auto gain, I'll get back to these a little bit later. This is kind of standard stuff. And if you just want to use your MIPI camera to take pictures of you know, birds in the back garden, you want to debayer, apply these uh, three fairly simple conversions and just dump the data out, right? Um, more advanced stuff, sensor tunings. I mean, I say joking, but not joking. Uh, you know, setting the gain on the sensor is not really proprietary information. It's not, it's not secret in any way. It's just a value on, a, on, a, on an analog input. But again, the companies are very sensitive about disclosing this information. Skin tones, low light, uh, noise reduction, contrast, lens flare. And um, these are all considered, you know, secret sauce. And my personal favorite is the uh, black mirror um, reverse, uh, I don't know, maybe we'd make a Star Trek joke about that. But I mean, take a look at the picture and remind yourself that this is one picture that was taken. So somebody pointed the camera at a lady in a shop and took one picture and the outcome was this. I'm just, I'm, I'm gonna point out the obvious. Those are her hands. And this is why this is a very freaky picture. Uh, is it a bug or a feature? I'll let you decide for yourself. But uh, <laughs> I think maybe you could call that a book. Uh, they, they took three pictures and they stitched it together. And the, the, the software thought it was three different people instead of one. But uh, this is the kind of proprietary information we need to protect. Ha. <laughs> uh, so soft ISP, what, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? The problem that we're trying to solve is on a number of different socks, what we get out of the, the kernel interface is just Bayer encoded data. So we, we will just take the data straight out of the sensor, dump it into user space, and not enable any of the um, hardware acceleration to debayer, to apply the three A's, to, to tune the, the output at all. Um, like I say, there's a reluctance to disclose. Uh, stuff that's considered secret sauce. Sometimes it goes in the other direction. It's acknowledged that we can disclose a lot of this stuff, um, that it's not really secret sauce, but the subset that we're going to disclose won't produce a good enough image. <laughs> so personally, I, I, I can't get my head around. So examples of where we need to use a soft ISP, um, IPU6 for the Intel, uh, CAMSX for Qualcomm SOX, the um, BeagleBone Play is another example. I think all of that class of, of TI SOC requires, not all actually, um, there's a BeagleBone Play and then there's another BeagleBone that's on their website and one has an ISP and the other doesn't. Um, and what we want really, I mean, so I've been going on about vendor specific solutions and that's nice, but for an open source solution, what we really want, what we really want is a reusable solution something that we can repeat and obtain pretty much the same results across socks. That's the, that's the right thing to do from a, you know, an, an open source and a sharing point of view. Um, and that's where we want to get to. So um, when I came on to CAMSS, it was at the same time that we were starting to produce some of these um, uh, laptops with Qualcomm socks inside of them that have MIPI cameras. And people start saying, well, where's the camera? Why doesn't the camera work? Uh, uh, and at the same time, nobody wants to disclose the hard ISP. Plus, it's, it's a lot of work, right? It's going to take six, eight, 12 months to get from just dumping raw MIPI data into user space to a, a, real, a real solution that can be upstreamed. So we started looking into LibCamera and doing the processing in there. And um, as a first pass, we said, well, we do it in the CPU. 
and then maybe we will start to enable some of the DSPs in there, and then maybe we'll start to use the GPU as well. And so we were working away on that, um, and at pretty much, uh, and you see this a lot in open source, I think, at exactly the same time, uh, a MIPI camera was being produced for IPU6, and the Intel platform was in the, the same situation, and Red Hat came along, and um, we synced up with them, and we started uh, collaborating to produce the, the final solution, which is about at version eight now, if you look on the, um, the lib camera uh, mailing list. So we're kind of you know, saying, please put a, put a full stop at the end of that comment. Um, and the uh, lib camera people have been very nice. They've been turning up to meetings regularly, giving us design. So in Paris, which I didn't attend because I had COVID, but I did attend virtually, we came up with this design. When I say we came up with this design, the lib camera guy said, please do your software exactly like this. So this is the basic design. There's a, um, a class that does the um, ISP bit, and then another class that does the IPA bit. The IPA bit is the thing that uh, calculates the sensor, um, what am I doing? I'm doing statistics. Statistics come out of the uh, ISP and the um, sensor tunings come out of the IPA. So that's, that's the basic design they want. And that's what we did. So Hans the Gold, and he's very well known, everybody knows who he is. Um, came in about version two of the patches. We're now on version eight. Um, and my colleague, Andre, I, I can't say, so who can say that second name for me? <laughs> I, I just call him Andre. <laughs> my colleague, Andre, uh, did most of the work to get uh, up and going on the, um, on the CPU. So most of the design work, the first pass of the debayering, the first pass of the three A's, the sensor tuning. Um, I've just kind of been playing along there, uh, helping them test. Um, uh, participating in the meetings and so on. Um, oh, no, don't go to sleep. Okay, so that's nice. Lip camera produces a debayered image and applies some level of 3A to it and plus tuning. Uh, does that just work? Uh, unfortunately, no, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't just work that way because uh, on Linux, what you usually have is a thing called a UVC camera. That's a USB camera that you plug in and the libraries know how to talk to that. Uh, Hangouts knows how to talk to that. Zoom knows how to talk to that. And off you go. Uh, most of the browsers don't know how to talk to a video for Linux uh, camera. So you're kind of stuffed. Uh, and in any case, Lib Camera is producing frame buffers that need to be consumed. So coming to the rescue is Pipewire. Um, so actually, the, the Jan Grulich in, in Red Hat did uh, all of the work to get Lib Camera and Pipewire talking to each other um, prior to us even starting this, this project for Lib Camera. Um, uh, this is actually Hans's slide, so I'm not really across the detail of it. Uh, Hans has um, made a copper repo for uh, Fedora uh, Rawhide. I think that's what it's called, Rawhide. Um, I did something for the Linaro Debian uh, distro that I'm running here. Um, and uh, Firefox has a pipe wire uh, config option that you can switch, which will allow you to consume the, it, it allows you to consume frame buffer data out of pipe wire. So Firefox doesn't know where the frame buffer data is coming from. And in this case, what we're doing is getting a lib camera to feed the data into Pipewire. So it can do the discovery mechanism through Pipewire, as well as the consumption of frame buffer data. So that, that actually is a, is a operating system level complete solution for your Hangouts. And I, I, have, I have run a Zoom call, not, not Hangouts, um, that way. Uh, Unfortunately, Chrome is the Pipewire integration is for some reason been stuck in there for the last 18 months. It's not, whoever owns the merge button hasn't hit merge. And um, I think it's suffering from bit rather at this stage. I'm not even sure if it would merge. So uh, that, that, that needs to be addressed. We need to get in there and figure out why nobody wants to hit merge on, on Chrome. 
Um, so future, future plans, unsurprisingly, and uh, I, I, if I have the time, I'll pull up a terminal and show you. Um, the CPU solution also implies high CPU consumption, <laughs> believe it or not. So uh, on an IMX8, uh, one of my, uh, another colleague of mine, well, he's not a, he's a coworker, I suppose colleague is the right word. Anyway, uh, uh, Milan, who works in Red Hat, um, was running this in, on an IMX8 for a, I think a 4K sensor and was getting two frames a second. So yeah, that, that, that's obviously, you know, no way, no, no that's, that's not useful. Um, on the Qualcomm laptop, I can get 30 frames a second easily. Hans gets 30 frames a second easily. But these are quite powerful processors in comparison to, you know, some of the, well, in the embedded space. So, yes, this is a solution for your IPU6 if you're not too concerned about battery and, you, you know, you're doing a 10-minute call, it's fine. But um, you couldn't really put it on a, on a pole top and run your, run your IMX6 from it for the simple reason that we're debayering with the CPU. So uh, what do you do about that? So we, you know, I, I was kind of very wet behind the ears when I started looking at this. So I, I could start saying, oh, OpenCL, everything works in OpenCL, it's great. You're doing OpenCL. And I was uh, gently educated by the... <laughs> Well, first of all, OpenCL, it, it has Qualcomm support, but it has downstream Qualcomm support. So uh, we would have to go and fix, we would have to go and implement an upstream solution for OpenCL to, to offload into the DSP or the GPU. So I, uh, personally, I think that's a project worthwhile doing, but uh, that's, that's an order of magnitude higher than, than just getting it to work on the GPU. So what we're looking at there is it says fragment shaders here um i did look at fragment shaders uh the issue with uh, using a so oh, okay sorry pardon me let me take a step back um you can use a gpu to depair and it's almost a perfect mechanism to do it because it has lots of little cores that operate in parallel right so if you think about it every single one of those pixels will then be delegated out to a core at the end of the day if you do your algorithm right, and it'll all just go in parallel. It'll do, you know, a few cache lines, and it, it, it'll be done. It'll be done. So I say cache lines. The lib camera solution requires an uncached buffer <laughs> to come uh, to come out of the uh, and to be passed out as a frame buffer. And you're going to ask the question. Why is it uncached? And the reason why it's uncached is because some of the video encoders, like Hantro on IMX8, uh, need physically uh, contiguous memory and uncached memory at that to, to work. So if we had a generic solution in LibCamera that used cache buffers, we would be precluding something like the Hantro. And so therefore, on the Qualcomm, on the, on the Intel machine, we have to use uncached buffers, and so we're debayering inside of an uncached buffer. And now you're seeing why this is so computationally costly for us, because we are, yeah, it's uncached. Um, and so therefore, GPU acceleration is where we want to go, because we can put a buffer into the GPU, have it operate on that. Uh, we can have a copy it over and do a cached computation and give us a buffer out. We can copy that back into an uncached buffer. There are many different ways we could, we could have it operate on, a, on, a, on an uncached buffer uh, massively in parallel. So a, a scalar processor is not really suited to uh, an algorithm that's done pixel for, for pixel, whereas, a, a, well, super scalar is maybe the wrong word, highly parallel system like a GPU is. Um, Upstream and LibCamera, we already had a GPU, um, an OpenGL uh, fragment shader to do debayering. So the first idea I had was, okay, let's just reuse that because, you know, good software, you don't throw it away, you just reuse it. Uh, even bad software, don't throw it away and uh, just reuse it. Don't make any effort you don't have to make. Um, but reading the pixel data out of a GPU when you have debayered it is extremely slow. You end up going through a thing called GL read pixels, 
which does the pixel conversion to RGBA, no matter what the internal format was. So that is horrifically slow and cannot be used. Um, and I spent a while kind of fighting with the buffers. So could I get a DMA buffer and could I pass it into the GPU and could I use this fragment shader again? And eventually, I think we, we decided that uh, a compute shader was the way to go. So what we're looking at here is a multi-pass compute shader um, to kind of semi-solve this problem generically in a lib camera. Um, in OpenGL, why in OpenGL? Uh, in GLES specifically, because it's the lowest common denominator across embedded platforms. So yes, Vulkan is the way to go, but not every one of these low-end systems is gonna support Vulkan. And everything that supports Vulkan can support OpenGLES via Zinc. So that's the, that's the, the theory, um, and that's still a work in progress. So you can see here, actually, Hans has, has kind of laid out contrast uh, enhancement is going to go into the CPU, but you can see all this other stuff here cannot be done in CPU. It's just, you know, it's never gonna work, so we have to go to GPU to make this work. Um, lib camera will go to version 0.3 when um, CPU ISP is merged. Um, at the moment, it's at 0.2, and that's, that's the kind of big thing we're waiting for to get done there. Um, here are all my references, and hopefully, oh, there I am. Hello. There it is in progress. Uh, give yourselves a round of applause, lads. Great stuff. Uh, questions? Oh, let me get a mic for you. Yeah, great presentation. Thank you. Uh, what all stages of the ISP were developed in the uh, soft ISP? I didn't catch it from the diagram. I'm just, uh, right. Can you answer the question what again, sir? What stages of the ISP were, uh, have been implemented so far? What stages of the soft ISP have been yeah, implemented? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. So, this. We have debayering and the three A's. Okay, debayering and the statistics. Okay. Yeah, right. so. Okay. We're accumulating statistics. We're pushing the gain up and down. We're doing yeah the three A's and, at and the moment. statistics for all all the three algorithms. Or like, yes. Okay. Yes. Cool. Uh, how much of percentage of CPU does it consume to ah. run it on the on ah. top top? Or, yeah, oh, for that. that's okay. I can follow. Uh, yeah. Let's find out. Let's open the terminal and find out. Um, it varies. Right. So actually, you'll see here I'm getting about 14 frames a second because I am running a debug build there. But trust me, if I oh Jesus, if I run, um, if I run the uh, release build, it, it it goes up to 30. So you'll see there, QCam is running is using 110 <laughs> percent on the debug build of one one core, a 1.5 gigahertz core. So, a lot. That, that will come down to about 60, maybe 80 when we're running the release build. Uh, but, but when you go down to an IMX8, that's five or six years old, with a, and this is a five megapixel um, sensor. So, you know, if you, if you go down in computational power and up in sensor resolution, it, eventually you run into a wall. Um, but, I mean, the, interestingly, the, the paper from, um, this guy here from Morgan McGuire is from 2009, yeah. And oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. And they get he gets um, really great performance from a 2009 era uh, Nvidia. So you know that's nearly 20 years ago now. I'm gonna say that we have high hopes that on an IMX8, maybe even on a single core IMX7, the GPU should be able to do a fair amount of chunking through once we get it going. Compute shaders. And the interesting thing about the compute shader actually is I, I, I think, and I'd be happy to be corrected, I think that the syntax is transferable from GLES to Vulkan. Um, so if you do it for uh, GLES, you can still conceivably run the compute shader in Vulkan. 
So that's nice. So, it, you know, if for whatever reason you can't run Zinc or somebody wants to come, al come along and write a Vulkan layer into LibCamera, you don't have to go and rewrite the the uh, debayering and the three A's and whatever other um, algorithms we put in there. And it's it's repeatable, right? So it's still repeatable. That, that's, that's what I really like about moving it out of the sock and moving it into the GPU with, in an open source project is it's repeatable. And um, yeah, that's why I'm excited about it. More questions? You're loud, but I need to get you on the. You're not so loud that they'll hear you over the video. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so completely new to this. Yeah. So naive question. So the three A's, I'm mm. guessing, are not about fixing the pixels, pixels you have. No, no. It's about getting the next frame adjusted so that Correct. they're better. Is that right? Three A's. I didn't go through that. Auto white balance. So. Here. Here is an image with a rose it down. Yeah, the white balance is wrong in this picture. That's why it looks blue. But it's not trying to fix the pixels in this frame. It's trying to measure this frame and set the sensor up for the next frame to be better. Is that correct? It provides, so you accumulate statistics when you are debayering the information, then you provide parameters back to the next iteration of the debayering of the frame, in which case you are going to correct the white balance. Okay. So some of it is sensor gain, but some of it is also color weighting. Okay. So but it, okay, so that's but it's the, about fixing the next frame. The next frame, yeah, because and, what, and the autofocus is a signal processing thing or a mechanical thing? Well it's like when you when you when you when you touch well, a yeah, yeah. superficial example, when you touch your screen, it focuses. But it doesn't, there's no optical mm -hmm. zoom there. It's, it's, a, it's digital focus. Uh -huh. More? More questions? Yes, gentleman in the green. I was just going to say, did you look at any sort of the vector processing type instructions like neon for improving the algorithms so neon so yeah so the cpu algorithm has been tweaked to do bilinear and and kind of it's more nearest neighbor at this point um we are not breaking it specifically into inline asm we're just leaving it up to the compiler to decide whether or not it's going to go and do something um, using a, a vector instruction like Neon or you know any of the any of the simmed instructions in x86. So yeah, we trust the compiler, which is you know maybe now is the time to try and you know premature optimization is some kind of you know deadly sin in software. So maybe now is the time to go and do that optimization on the CPU side. Um, personally, I'm more interested in optimizing in the GPU because I think that's where we're going to get the bang for the buck in the end. Uh, but yes, yes, it was looked at, but it wasn't um, inlined specifically. Or going once, going twice, going three times. No, cool. Okay, thanks very much for turning up. Um, I don't know how I'm supposed to end the presentation. Just, I guess everybody just leaves. This, <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. I give myself a round of applause. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs>